You ever had one of those weeks where the devil just kind of shooting darts at you left and right? Or are you yes. trying to take them from every angle? Like we've had it this week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you feel like uh, you don't block most of them and every one of them hits you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I've had about uh, two and a half years of that. <laughs> it doesn't help that it culminates in a week like this. Uh, but uh, with that said, my point with saying that was not that um, the devil's tried to kill me two or three times this week, but that uh, for over the last over two years, um, he's come against me with several things. And what it's done is it's, it's worn me down. And I've seen that. And I've pressed on and pressed through and just... Uh, I'm a kind of person that keeps his head down without looking up and just keep grunting. Sometimes that would take the best of it. Well, what, it, uh, what it's done to me, and I've noticed, <clears throat> is that uh, that it's it's changed, it's built some characters in me, but it's also changed some things in me that I didn't like. Uh, and so my point to bringing that up is that I owe, I owe everybody a... Uh, a public repentance, really, because I know first impressions are a big thing, and and, and I am still in the season of first impression with most people here. <coughs> um, and what's the what this has done to me over the last couple of years is it's done <coughs> something that, like steal my joy. And so what I've been walking in is not a person that uh, that I once was, but it's some person that I've become. And I don't like it. And uh, it's it's hard to uh, you know have your wife, you know, or somebody, and uh, especially your wife, um, <laughs> tell you the truth, really. But um, you know, just tell you you're not a nice person to be around, or something. And what she's saying by that is you're okay to be around, but you sure were better to be around in those years. And um, and so I had to reflect on that. Why was that? How that come to be, and um, it's just it's those circumstances, those life things that come that you're gonna get, and uh, they've uh, along the way I've picked up some things, and so hence our message tonight is gonna uh, reflect that. So it's an unpolished message because it's an unfinished message. Um, it's something that's a current message, though, and uh, and something that the Lord's teaching in me, and so I've just been <coughs> able to get in the Word and put it to paper, and therefore return it to you. If you have any revelation on it, then you'll teach it back to me, and therefore there goes the body. Amen. 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 We'll thank it. Uh, so we're on um, December fifteenth, two thousand ten, and uh, recently. Uh, in one of our Monday night Bible studies uh, in Ephesians, right? Still? I know I've missed we just finished it. Yeah, I can't even remember the last couple of months. <laughs> um, the question came up, uh, how do you desire the gifts? How do you obtain a desire? Um, is, uh, is this something that is self <coughs> Is this something that you can just create? Uh, or is it a supernatural conception? Um, turn to uh, Genesis 1. one. <laughs> there. There. So in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, I'll stop there. Uh, Pastor Buzz Tremay once taught me a, a, a biblical principle that has proven to be divine uh, and practical truth in my life. Um, he pointed out that when the Spirit of God and the Word of God comes together, there is the power. And so we see um, as the Spirit of God hovered over the deluge of the chaos right here, you know, the waters. In verse 3 it reads, And God said. And for the first time in the realm of men, the spirit and the spoken word had come together. 
And what happened? God demonstrated his power. Um, <clears throat> turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 1. Verse 26. And in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary, asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Um, so, to me, what we see here again is the same principle uh, displayed as we've seen in Genesis. Um, I believe uh, we just witnessed um, the demonstration again in, in Luke of, uh, of what happened when the Spirit and the word came together. I believe the potential of God, uh, I believe the potential that God found in Mary was the embedding of the word in her. Um, she, had, she had the promise within her. I believe um, it was because Mary believed the promised word uh, that Mary would carry and give birth to the promised word. And so, um, and so we see God's promised word in Mary, and God's Holy Spirit overshadows her. And what happens next is Mary conceives the most powerful manifestation of God that mankind would ever see: Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. So, um, so where the Spirit and the Word come together, there's the power. We see it again. So my question was, are we lacking power in our walk? And if so, uh, let's be real. When it comes down to it, we're all greedy by nature. And we say, what do I mean? I say, well, we're always trying to, we're always trying to get a little something out of God, if you think about it. Um, whether it's our simplest needs or we're just trying to get to heaven you always hear that I mean really uh, but I'm not, I'm not really talking about that I'm talking about seeing things supernaturally happen in our life um, are you lacking the spirit or are you lacking the word which one in one area or the other if you're lacking the power you're missing one or the other um, so our question earlier was how do we conceive a supernatural desire in our lives? Um, come on, we don't even have to try to conceive a uh, fleshly desire. Right. You know, it's kind of a given. We've got to fight that off. Right. Yeah. But when it comes to conceiving supernatural desires, this is something we struggle with. Um, it's so easy, it's, it seems it's so easy to, to hear the tempter's voice. And um, yet we need years of discipline and training to hear the Father's voice. It's true. Mm. I believe if we would just allow that union of the Spirit of God and uh, that He's deposited in us, and His spoken word or His written word to unite, then we would see power in us. What can be conceived in our life 
and in your life would be power if we would let this happen. <coughs> I guess I guess if I'm gonna sit here and accuse us of being guilty, the well, one thing I'd want to be is found guilty on the day of judgment would be a this of being found guilty of having a desire for power. <coughs> God says, uh, okay, well, I condemn you guilty, guilty of greed, then yeah, I'm greedy for all this power. Um, I would say let it be found, let it be said of me that I'm found guilty of, of uh, <coughs> word, um, possession with intent to distribute. <laughs> PSD. <laughs> Powerful supernatural desire. Yeah. Uh, when the spirit and the word come together, what it produces is a powerful supernatural desire to carry out the will of God in my life. Amen. 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 Um, last week, a brother and I were uh, questioning what was it that Jesus meant in Luke nine twenty three and twenty four. Somebody read that for me. Then he said to the Lord, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for me will save it. Okay, so Jesus didn't tell us that we are to take up his cross and follow him daily, did he? No. No. He said, Take up your cross and follow him daily. Yeah. Hmm. How many times have you tried to um, either physically or spiritually carry his cross? Mm -hmm. And when we do, it doesn't take long for us to realize that we could never carry it. We can never carry what our Jesus was built to carry out for us. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Or do we understand that? We can't fully understand it because we try to do it all the time. Are we carrying our cross or are we trying to bear his? Mm -hmm. Were we created to bear a cross of his size? Mm -hmm. When he was crucified, did he not bear the sins of all mankind on his shoulders? Yes. And yet you want to try to bear that? Bear yours. Mm -hmm. I believe his wounds went deeper than the flesh. I believe you watch the movie and you only see you only begin to see what happened. Mm. I believe he agonized in tears of blood because his cross was heavy. I believe um, he carried some things so that you would never have to. And he had never intended you to. I believe things that um, that we that were never created to carry when placed on our shoulders, it crushes. Yes. Yeah. But when placed on His, it brings Him glory. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen an unbelieving family with uh, one of the members being, uh, being saved? You see the person running rampant throughout the family. They're trying to help this one over here. They're trying to do for this one over there. You know, trying to appease this one even though they have nothing to do with Jesus. They're trying to keep peace over here, keeping burden after burden on the shoulder, and they go from being led by the Spirit to being the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, they become this thing that God never intended them to be. All of a sudden, they become, their foundation becomes faulty. <coughs> Because now they put their self in the wrong place. I never intended that. I believe um, we are learn we're to learn and be able to discern when some somebody's time in our life has started and when it's over. <coughs> I'm talking about knowing when when God has sent somebody in your life either to teach you, to be a friend to you, to be a helper to you. You should have eyes to see that this person has come in. God sent them, 
and you're to embrace that. But you're also to know when their their time in your life is over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, that was an old Kenny Rogers song. Uh, it said, uh, <laughs> "I'm trying to say it without singing it because I don't think I'm right. singing." <laughs> you got to know when to hold them, yeah. know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Know when to run. Right. Uh, well, I think that's a divine truth, and it was hijacked by the country music scene. <laughs> uh, so our title tonight would be um, Picking Them Up and laying them down. Burdens. Picking them up and laying them down. Know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. It's a discernment, an understanding. Amen. Um, and tonight's question would be, if you're writing this burdens, what's those two dots, Colin? Colin. Where did you pick them up, and should you be carrying them? Y'all remember the uh, story of Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. So the serpent comes to eat, right, in the garden, and he deceives her into taking the forbidden fruit. In doing so, Eve sins uh, against God, and so she pays the price because along with sin comes decay. Okay, death. <coughs> and if you could for a minute, I want you to use your imagination. I want you to picture um, with me Adam as he finds Eve. And for the first time in their existence, she doesn't look so well. Mm -hmm. Something has infected her. Mm -hmm. She's in a very dark place. Mm -hmm. Something's happened in her mind. And the consequences of sin are setting in. For the first time, she can feel the effects of decay. I can imagine that Adam was crushed. He's looking on her. He hadn't yet entered into this. Could you imagine that just Eve's influence must have made him sick to his stomach? With grief. Why? Because he loved it. Think about it. Adam walked and talked with God. Face to face. He had never felt the effects of decay. Never. His mind was brilliant. His teacher was Yahweh. He had clear understanding of what was happening to her. So why did he eat the food? Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't. He made the choice. Didn't he realize that this would be his same fate? Did his logic speak to him? Letting pride get in the way? And thinking that he could somehow enter into a disobedience with her? And somehow save her out of it? <coughs> Was he not entering into suffering with another? I mean, come on, that's holy, right? Was he not laying down his life for another? Was the first Adam trying to do what the last Adam done? Adam's the story of mankind, and even though Adam was holy, he wasn't perfect. Even though he had a passion in his heart to redeem his beloved, he couldn't because he wasn't perfect. So he had to have the last Adam to do that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now imagine with me for a moment the day that Adam and Eve were <coughs> escorted out of the garden. Hmm. For the first time. I believe it had to be like walking out of the cool of the day into a sauna. 
the atmosphere. The atmosphere from the garden to their new dwelling place, their new home. It must have been thick and heavy. What a feeling. They must have been able to feel the instant burden, the toils, and the oppression of the world instantly compared to what they just came from. Maybe no different than the things that we have felt before Jesus. Better yet, maybe they were experiencing for the first time some of the things you and I still face after Jesus. Should this be? Is this what Jesus intended for your Christian experience? My greatest fear is that someone comes in my path of life and they can't distinguish me from the rest of the world that hasn't been cured of their disease. Yet I have. There should be something different in me. Amen. I should not look like the infected ones. Amen. So what... um. Question, what do you look like to your neighbors when you are loaded down with unnecessary baggage? That's a good question. <coughs> when they are looking at you for structure and balance in their life, are you buckling under the pressure from unnecessary baggage? Are you carrying something that you were not intended to carry? Turn with me to uh, Matthew 11. There. Okay. There. There. Look at them. There. If I pass out, it's not the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> it's a six drug one. <laughs> Because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and revealed them to little children. <coughs> yes, Father, for these were your good. This was your good pleasure. All things have been com <coughs> committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, so we shouldn't miss the backdrop here. Jesus is enjoying a Sabbath day rest with his disciples, and they're walking through the grain fields. He starts to teach them according um, to what they're surrounded by, which were uh, grain fields. He says, um, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will become to you a true Sabbath, a true Shabbat, a rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So now you can imagine that his audience understood that he would have been comparing himself to the oxen <coughs> that would have been uh, yoked together in order to plow the fields for the harvest which they were walking in. So he totally took this atmosphere, to it, turned it around, and taught from it. It's beautiful. Jesus was saying, think about this. When one oxen was connected to another, they were done so by a wooden beam uh, that could rest 
on, on one oxen's shoulder to the other. Uh, they called it a yoke. Now they would send the oxen out in pairs. One mature ox and one immature ox. So that the immature ox could learn from the mature. So Jesus' audience would have understood that the black oxen were valuable for their skin. And that the red oxen were valuable for their flesh. But they understood also that the pure white oxen were most valuable for their plowing. And the person who walked behind the oxen that plowed, does anybody know what they were called? A bond servant. <coughs> so in the Hebrew culture, when you thought of an oxen, you thought of a burden bearer. And Jesus totally took this to explain this concept to him. So our question tonight was burdens. Where did you pick them up and should you be carrying them? So in one sense, it seems godly to bear a burden. You agree? Yeah. And at other times, it seems like sin. Yeah. So as a, so as a, I'm just studying out burdens. I've narrowed them down to a few categories, and they're these: one, burdens of sin. These are self-inflicted burdens, and there's consequences. Two, burdens of discipline. These are God-inflicted burdens. And they are a means to an end. They are sent in order to correct. Number three is shared burdens. And these are physical, spiritual, and emotional burdens of needs for others. Some would say repentance is a burden, but that's a lie. It's true repentance is not a burden, it's liberation. Amen. Yeah. Now numbers two and three, burdens of discipline and shared burdens, are God burdens, and his burdens are burdens of love. Now burdens of sin originate from us, but in obedience will be carried by him. Look at um, Luke chapter 11. I'll tell you what, I'll just read it to you. 1146. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. There's another one, religious burdens. You ever heard of misery loves company? Yes. Yeah. This is it. When someone carries worldly burdens, the most common thing they do is try to have someone else carry it for them. They call these people freeloaders. <laughs> when you are able to have someone join in your misery, it's, it sort of justifies it for you. It justifies it says, okay, if this person joins in what I'm doing, it must be right, you know. So this study on burdens uh, brought me to a, a prophet named Amos. And um, as I studied Amos, I found some pretty significant evidence that Amos could qualify as a type and a shadow of Messiah. Amen. Here they are, the types. Although Amos, Amos's hometown was Tekoa, near Galilee, he lived in the kingdom of Judah but preached in Israel. It is said that his descendants migrated to Bethlehem. Micah calls Amos a prince among men. Amos was a shepherd or a herdsman and a prophet. He was a tender of sycamore fig trees and we know that the fig tree represent Israel. Amos was not accepted as a prophet in his hometown. Right? These are all lining up with Jesus. He was expelled and had to revert to writing his words. He set the trend for the prophets 
that came after him when he announced that he was not a prophet for hire. He needed no compensation because God had already taken care of him by giving him a trade. And that he was called from behind his herd <coughs> as a divine call. Amos' message, ritualistic zeal and the richest burnt offerings avail nothing with God. Such things are contemptuous in his sight. Amos reduced the law of Moses to one commandment. Seek me and live. Mm. The meaning of Amos' name? Burden bearer. Mm. Okay, so if Amos, his name can be burden bearer, and is a type of the Messiah, and I believe this is pretty clear, and if Jesus likens himself to a mature ox, and us the immature ox, and ask us to yoke together with him and plow for the harvest, is this making it any easier to see Jesus as our burden bearer? It's pretty clear. Can I use your permit? Okay, so this is an. Um, stand up here. This is this is the ancient way of doing. Uh, what you call it? Right there, PowerPoint. <laughs> this is ancient PowerPoint. Can you wear this one? <laughs> okay, so if um, Jesus is the burden bearer. And what does it look like? What does Jesus being your burden bearer in your life look like? Um, how do we let Jesus carry our burdens and carry our cross at the same time? Um, example, the backpack I put on there, we're going to call this the backpack of sin. Amen? <laughs> we're going to call this his burden. <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, right now, Eric is not your pastor. This is Eric, the man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Eric hadn't met Jesus yet, and he's got a burden on his back. he got a burden of sin on his back. Okay, but Eric all of a sudden has a revelation. Can you look like that? <laughs> okay. First comes revelation. <coughs> then comes repentance. Repentance. <coughs> <coughs> Okay. And so he repents, and what does Jesus do? He takes his burden. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. Okay, but what Jesus does, he doesn't just take it away, but he wears it himself. Mm -hmm. He takes it. He puts it on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. All right. Like Chris Sim taught me, he says, what sin? You know? <laughs> <laughs> looking for it. What's it? Okay? That's good. And then um, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? My burdens go. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I get that. Here's the joy there you go. that we get. Good. This is how it should stay. Yeah. Okay? So Jesus takes it and he takes it to his cross. And he burns it on his eternal altar. You agree? Amen. Okay. But then Jesus places his burden. This is going to go from the burden of sin to Jesus' burden. He places his burden back on Eric because now Eric is a servant of the Most High God. Amen. Not only does that, but he places a sword in his hand. Amen. <laughs> That's right. And he teaches them how to use it. So he's, so, so we have we have Eric, the servant of the Most High God, with a, a burden for Jesus on his back, a sword in his hand. <coughs> okay. And now God makes him a soldier. Alright, so now he's a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens next is where it gets interesting. 
And I call it the journey. Um, where we learn to pick them up and where we learn to lay them down. We have um, Eric, our powerful soldier of God. Amen? Y'all can agree with that? He looks powerful. Yeah. All right. He's been saved, sanctified, <laughs> Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized. There's no fire from love. That's right. There you go. He's red. All the way, um, he's learned how to lay, lay down burdens. Uh, but the problem is that he's also learned to pick them up. And so what happens is he starts to collect burdens. <coughs> All right. Load them down. All right. We can call this burden guilt. All the way. <laughs> right? Guilt. Yeah. yeah. So it's got to carry guilt. <laughs> carry guilt. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, so he's carrying guilt <laughs> as though Jesus never washed him clean. Huh. Amen? Amen. And that he's reflecting back on these things as though he's guilty for something. When God's declared him innocent Amen. because of the blood of Jesus. All right, then we're going to call this one fear. Mm. There? Yep. All right, so now along the way, our soldier of God has picked up <laughs> guilt, and he's picked up fear. Mm. How about a little doubt? Uh -oh. Okay, doubt. You have a weight big enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Can you climb in that bag? It's got 45 pound plates. Oh, he does have it. So doubt is linked to unbelief. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Alright, then we got strife. Anybody got some strife? Yes. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> 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 All right, so we got strife. This would be struggling to achieve things from God that are freely given. Okay? How about a little bit of creed, dogmas? Anybody <laughs> got some? Hmm. How about some um, self motivated deeds? Stop being led by the Spirit. Let's just go work for Jesus. You know, let's go work and work and work until we wear, you know, we wear ourselves out for Jesus. Because, you know, that's holy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get about being led by the Spirit. Well, I got this. Okay, is that getting heavy? Pretty heavy. <laughs> <laughs> that's 40 pounds so far. <laughs> okay, and here's, uh, here's one that I've been dealing with lately. Memories. Mm -hmm. Here's what I wrote. When memories go from enjoyable past moments to dwell upon current thoughts that bring you to a place where you are reliving them and cause you to want to turn back, you just picked up a burden. Doubt, worry, fear, all these lead to strife. And these are all symptoms of a lack of trust. So now you find yourself as a child of God, but you're a poor reflection of what God intended you to be. This is a facade until you see the burdens that are carried. Amen? And these things are heavy. These things are weighing you down. Your performance cannot be peaked with this on your back. Okay, so Eric... He loves Jesus with all his heart, but now finds himself burdened down by the traps of this world. <laughs> his lack of vision. <laughs> all right. Come here, sir. Both of them. His lack of vision, burden down, he's got a sword in his hand, can't use it. <laughs> he's bound by the enemy. And though this is where you find most Christians these days. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay. 
So now instead of having Pastor Eric, we have Coach Eric. Because you know, the devil's blinded his vision for his life, and he can no longer see the path and enter into the call that Jesus has for him. You no longer have Pastor Mike, you have Painter Mike, or something of these sorts. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. Maybe God called you to be one thing, but you end up another. Maybe you should be a powerful woman of God, but you're a housewife, or vice versa. Maybe you should be a powerful housewife and not speak at all. Mm. Amen. Mm. If that's what God intended for you. <laughs> Maybe the words of God should come in your house mm. from the powerful housewife. Amen? Amen. Okay. So I wanted Eric to read this. Y'all turn with me to Psalms 38. Pretty easy for him since he found up. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have pierced me, and your hand has come down upon me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me, like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie open before you, O Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds. My strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. Those who seek my life are my life set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deception. I am like a deaf man who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear whose mouth can offer no reply. I wait for you, O Lord. You will answer, O Lord my God. For I have said, Do not let them gloat or exalt themselves over me when my foot slips. For I am about to fall, and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. Many are those who are my vigorous enemies, those who hate me without reason or numerous. Those who repay my good with evil slander me when I pursue what is good. O Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far from me, O my God. Come quickly to help me, O Lord my Savior. Amen. Okay. So although that didn't sound like a victorious believer, it sounds like a wise one to me. They find themselves bound. Bound up. <coughs> they picked up some things. <laughs> and they're staggering. <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> and at least at the end, in the wisdom, they cry out to God for repentance. That's what it takes. Yes. Amen. And so what happens is God comes in like a flood. He releases you. Set you back on your feet. I'll take it. <laughs> Takes your burdens and releases you. Mm -hmm. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
So we got burdens, which are heavy. Would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> and can you tell me the first thing that goes when heavy burdens come in? Joy. 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 God, that's a good word. It's the first thing that's stolen from you. I'll be very transparent. It's the first thing that's been stolen from me. It's been stolen a long time. And with the tenaciousness that God's put in me, you will, you will see it restored to me. I promise Amen. you. Amen. 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 <laughs> Galatians 6 1 says, I can turn there. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Yeah. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. <laughs> then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry his own load. You should not be trying to carry the load that Jesus had to carry. He's given you something, but his load is light so that you can travel with. If sin is simply missing the mark, are we missing the mark? When we try to carry the load in our life that we were supposed to trust Jesus, yeah. our burden bearer to carry? Yes. Yes. You may not have a clue <coughs> about what the person on the left or the right of you <coughs> has endured in their life. But I'm willing to bet that they're, they are here tonight just like I am. Because they have, they have had to carry, or previously <coughs> carried, heavy burdens. You agree? Yes. yes. Okay, so our question. Burdens, where did they come from? And should you be carrying? Are these burdens of love that you're carrying? Mm -hmm. Are these burdens are self-inflicted? Do you believe that... Um, when Jesus labored his way to the cross, that he carried the sin burden for all mankind on his shoulders? I think we do. Yeah. Okay, so somebody read for me Hebrews 12, 1 to 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that is so easily entangled. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scoring its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as a son. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, 
It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled but rather healed. I heard nothing harsh in that. Mm -hmm. Not at all. I heard love, love, a little love and a little more love. Amen. I heard some uh, burdens of discipline. I heard some things that God puts on us in order for us to come out better. Some things that puts on us in order that some things will culminate in our life so that it would be a means to an end. So that you would walk even lighter. And so that you could run that race that he was talking about. I heard that's all I heard. <coughs> I said all that I said in these last few last <coughs> minutes, however long I've been up here, just so when I read this next verse, that y'all could understand it how I did. Hmm. Y'all mark this one. Proverbs 14 4. Where there are no oxen. The manger is empty, but from the strength of an ox comes an abundant harvest. I had a revelation one time of the event where Jesus was washing Peter's feet. Y'all remember that? Yeah. This is often seen uh, as uh, Jesus set an example of humility for us. But remember what Jesus told Peter when Peter tried to stop him from washing his feet? Jesus said, if you do not allow me to do this, you have no part with me. Mm -hmm. I had this picture of the painting in my house forever. And I walked by it and thought it was you know, great. And uh, one day the Holy Spirit just hit me and showed me. And he showed me, uh, even though we were servants of Jesus, he also provides a service for us. Mm -hmm. We must allow His Spirit to operate in us. And we must allow Him to be our burden bearer. We, he must, we serve Him and He serves us. Amen. We are one and one. We serve Him. He serves us. We wash His feet. He washes ours. It can be no other way. He says, if you don't let me do this for you, you have no part with me. Hmm. So in a sense, he's still saying, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you will have no part with me. Okay, so where there is no ox, there is no harvest. If you expect a harvest in your life, if you expect the fruit that's been, or the seeds that's been planted in your life to spring up and to feed others, for your family to be full, then you there must be an ox present. There must be a burden bearer present. <coughs> you cannot live out your walk. You cannot live victorious. You cannot walk abundantly. Which Jesus says, I come that you would have abundant life <coughs> if you do not let him carry the things that you were never intended to carry. Amen. He is our burden bearer. Amen. We're to carry burdens for others. Yeah. And we're to carry burdens <coughs> for needs. But we're not to carry sin burdens. We're not to be burdened by other people's sin. This is for Him to carry. It's His Holy Spirit that plows before us. And we walk in it, <coughs> side by side, yoked with Him, harvesting. Mm -hmm. Plowing for the harvest. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's where we're stopping. All right. I only knew bits and pieces of what Michael was going to preach tonight. But I tell you, I sure enjoyed it. Wow. Fed me, corrected me, and encouraged me, all of those things. And my back sore. <laughs> um, I know everybody will take something different away from the message. You have no obligation in your life, not one, except to follow the leading of the Spirit.
you're, and you're lying to yourself, if you think that you can walk around day after day without the joy of the Spirit, but that you're led by the Spirit, it doesn't work. It doesn't. And he correctly put his finger on the barometer. I'm not talking about some fake, insincere facade that we put on for people. But when you look back at a week, when you spent more days under a heavy load, burdened, whether it's about work or your carpet or life or whatever makes no difference, we are not living as he intended for us to live. Ironically, the last time I heard a message like this, it came from a man named Brad Lively, and it involved the backpack. And he carried it with a heavy burden just like that. And when John Bunyan told this story in the 1700s, it was a man carrying a heavy burden as well, through a sloth of despondency. This is because this is universal, and we have a way of getting completely free at the cross and then adding a little burden with every step that we move on from there. Between now and Sunday, figure out how to get rid of them. Not to please your pastor, not to please your husband, not to please your co-workers. To please Jesus, because it really is an insult to the cross to carry things that he paid for. I mean, it really is. The scripture that he keeps referring to about Peter and John says to show them the full extent of his love. He washed their feet. The thing of the cross is the great thing, and it is. It's the greatest in history. But how many times do you have to wash your feet? You only go to that cross one time. He's washing you and rewashing you and washing you and rewashing you every day because you're picking up things as you walk along that we weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, you pray. Father God, I just uh, I want to repent before you right now. Father, I am sorry, Lord God, for carrying anything that I was supposed to trust you to carry, Lord God. Father, I just want to uh, lay myself before you right now, Lord God. Father God, you are the burden bearer in my life, Lord Jesus. Father, you are the burden bearer in all of our lives, Father. Father, you came to carry loads so that we would walk light. Father, you came to carry loads so that we would walk victorious and with joy. Father, I just thank you, Father. And I ask you right now, Lord God, that you would renew our joy, Lord God. Yes. Father, that you would make our joy full in you, Lord Jesus. Father, that we would know you more, Lord God. Father, that we would get close to you and be yoked to you, Jesus. Father, we would move nothing but one way, and that's forward in your kingdom, Lord God. Father, I just thank you and love you, Lord God. I ask, Lord God, that you just you put your spirit in everybody in here, Lord God. That spirit of tenaciousness, Lord Jesus. A spirit of uh, uh, that says, we're going to do one thing, and that's move forward in Jesus. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord God, and I receive, Lord God, your forgiveness. Yes, Lord, amen. Father, because, Lord God, I know that you're quick to forgive, Father, because you love us, Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord God. Saints, we uh we are dismissed. Come back Sunday, burden free. I want to bear witness with your with your message because God's delivered me this day from a burden. Mm -hmm. What was so cool about your message and about the timing of it is <coughs> that burden was found with iniquity in me. And I had to learn to want to let go of that iniquity in me so that I wanted him to take the burden. But but I hadn't been ready to let go of the iniquity. And when I was ready to let go of the iniquity, he took the burden too. Amen. Amen. Amen.